Hello everybody again and welcome. I wanted to take a pause from our coding and just kind of look at a new robot that I've just built. I actually was playing with this guy and installing the algorithms for the low level behaviors yesterday. Uh, this is Henry the Ninth. I name all my robots Henry. It's just they're kings and there was a lot of them and they had numbers and it, I'm not very original. <laughs> if you got a if you got a cool name that you think I should name the robot, uh, definitely put it in the comments. There, he's Henry for now, unless somebody comes up with something super clever. Henry here is a larger platform than the ones we've been working with. So you know we've been building algorithms like on these little guys. These guys are quick and nimble. Uh, this guy is a little bit big and slower and, you know, can be fast. Obviously, I can change the gearing. In fact, I played with uh, these are two to one reduction after the 60 to one gear metal motors. I actually changed the two to one out and made it one to one yesterday, but he was a little bit too zippy uh, for my furniture. So I, I brought them back to the two to one uh, and it's for this size, it's much more manageable, especially in my environment, which is a house. So there's lots of furniture everywhere. Uh, when I'm going to bring this back to the school, I think I'm going to have more open spaces there. So I'm going to see uh, there, there might be, you know, a little bit more opportunity for speed, but I don't think he needs a whole lot more speed right now. I'm gonna let him grow into that. Let me talk a little bit about where the videos are going uh, first. So I'm going to be continuing working with these guys on the videos, but you will see uh, this guy. So this is actually Henry VIII, this is Henry IX. As I said many times in the videos, the algorithms that we're learning and using here that we're working up to this low level potential fields right now, work across all robots like you just tune for it now tuning is the art form uh, we're going to see that as we get more and more into this but the algorithms themselves the math works right you can choose different approaches so for example i did a very light exponential curve on this guy for how he reacts to obstacles coming closer. So instead of doing a linear approach where say an obstacle, let, let's just pretend I think his range, I set it to two meters for max distance. So let's say that, you know, at one meter, he would have a 50% reaction if it was a linear curve, right? But I actually have him at a 0 0.01 X squared. So actually what happens at 50% is he has like a 25% reaction. And then it gets increasingly more reactive as it gets closer and closer and closer. So little bit, little bit, little bit, more, 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 lots more at the end, right? So you can play with those things though. A linear approach is going to give you different bonds, but that's the beauty of math, right? You can choose different attacks, but both of these things can theoretically be programmed either way. And the tuning is what matters. And that's why we're always building out our code so that we have all our parameters up top. We can change them, tune it, no problem. You can take that same code uh, and except for the low level stuff, like obviously the motor control will be different, right? Because on that guy, now I'm using I2C. On these guys, I'm using the Polu library for motor control. So those things change, but that's easy to swap out your algorithm when you actually build your navigation is the same, it comes across. So we're going to be continuing this, we're gonna be building potential fields up in this. For fun, I'm going to be showing it working here too, just so you can see both. As I've said before, any robot goes. So you just have to tune it for yours. If you wanna follow as closely along as possible, uh, this guy is the one that I'm going to be using uh, the majority of the time. So, and, and I'm always going to use this as my reference because it's, it's a cool little unit, honestly. And for people who don't want to, you know, wrench on these things, a lot of people do, but, you know, for people who don't, that thing comes, you know, packed and ready to go. Since we're going to be using this robot a lot during the series, along with the smaller ones, I wanted to take a few moments to talk about how it is constructed. You can buy kits such as the Tetrix one that this is based on, but they're not really intended to build a specific robot. There's simple metal hardware, there's wheels and gears, there's DC motors, and this one even had the servo controllers, but you're going to build your own design. So I'm not gonna go through and create a step-by-step -step tutorial, however, I want to talk about the major components and how I use them and talk a little bit about the differences in the code. 
If you are interested in building a robot like Henry IX here, I highly recommend checking out the DroneBot Workshop YouTube channel and also the forums that are run by that same YouTube channel. There is a great community of people here who work on all kinds of electronics projects, including robots like this one. Now let's take a look at our design of Henry. I wanna talk a little bit about this guy's platform. So right now, what we're seeing here is the low level platform that we're building up right now up to potential fields. Once we get that far, I'm going to add more layers. I'll talk about that in a moment. So for right now, I have these two uh, Torque Nato motors. Uh, they're gear metal motors. I think they're 60 to one uh, ratio. As I said before, they also have built-in encoders. You guys know I love encoders. Uh, that's how potential fields, my goal setting behavior works. Now I'm gonna be looking at visual odometry on the higher level layer. We'll talk about that in a few moments. I have just an Arduino Uno here, so one. Now I know a lot of people for you know larger robots, they tend to use multiple controllers and there's nothing wrong with that. Personally, I am a believer that until I need to, like if I went you know with more banks of, of ultrasonics, I would probably add some micros or small Arduino units to control those, but you gotta deal with the transmission of the data and sending it back and forth and all that good stuff. I honestly believe that if you're programming correctly, as we're learning here, and you're not using delays, and you're setting up all of your sensors to only fire when they should, because we've learned ultrasonic sensors take a certain amount of time to send out the sound and have it bounce back and that kind of thing. And if we set our pulse in function correctly, where it doesn't take a second to time out, if it doesn't hear anything, we're going to avoid problems, right? So if you do everything right, you can actually get a lot done with one microcontroller and it makes your code a lot less complicated when you're trying to communicate between them. So I have honestly never had an issue doing a potential fields low level controller on one microcontroller and I just haven't. So until the day I do, then I will step up to, to more than one controller, but I don't think that's necessary for this guy. Not yet. There will be a higher level controller. Again, talking about that more later. I have this high technic servo controller here. This is actually, uh, it's actually a servo and a DC motor. It's on both sides of this metal plate. You can't see the one on the bottom. I'm not using the servo one right now, uh, but I might in the future. It is possible that I will get another uh, DC motor controller uh, and hook that up. But for now, it's fine. I am not using the this for the encoders, though, because I had zero luck using the encoders through I2C uh, on this thing. So I just directly hardwired the encoders and I brought them into some PWM ports on the Arduino. And I'm using a library to, to help manage that with the interrupts. And that's working great. I have five ultrasonic sensors here. They are all hooked up. I have them all wired up with echo and trigger because I have a Arduino Mega and I have plenty of ports for it. Um, you know, you can actually wire them so that the echo and the trigger go to one Arduino pin. So I have all five of them wired. Uh, they are all accounted for in my algorithm. I have two batteries in here. So there is a uh, larger battery pack for the, the motors, for the DC motors. And then I have one of those, you know, larger uh, phone backup lithium units that I'm using to power the electronics. Now that we've talked about how we create Henry, I want to talk a little bit about his purpose. He's obviously cool for analyzing how these algorithms work, uh, whether it's our little robot like our Polu one or a bigger model. But beyond that, he's also going to be the way forward once we get past the single microcontroller low level setup. So as I move into higher level algorithms like SLAM and visual odometry and just general planning, we're going to need a bigger platform. So Henry IX will then kind of take the mantle and become the way forward. Let's take a quick look at some of the sensors and controllers that we can use at a higher level on Henry than we can say on the Polo robot. Let's start here. This is a LiDAR sensor. This one, I might actually work in a potential fields algorithm, but it might actually be used in the high level navigator as well. But uh, this is a laser rangefinder. So our ultrasonics here use sound waves for pinpointing you know, distance by bouncing a sound wave. This does light. 
So obviously light is much faster. I can get many, many, many more readings. This thing spins super fast. I get a 360 degree view. In fact, it's super accurate as well within a millimeter. So you can actually map your entire environment very, very, very accurately with these things. So that now, depending on how I decide to use it, can either be used for potential fields and then you change the algorithm a little bit to work off of the map instead of the just the perceived obstacles that you have. Right now we have five ultrasonic sensors, right? So I have five opportunities to get a single point of data back that tells me about my environment. Or I have 360 degrees of super accurate data all the time. So you just approach the algorithm differently because you have the whole map, but the idea is the same. Or I can leave the potential fields the way it is using the ultrasonic sensors uh, for basic you know, navigation. And again, we have that goal behavior we're gonna work up to. See that here, actually, I'll play that now while he's going to the goal. So we combine those two things and then we have our higher level uh, software decide where to go. So if I tell Henry here to go to the living room, Right, Henry will, in the higher level, know what room he's in, know from the map where the living room is, use a algorithm that we'll discuss later, this is after we go through potential fields, maybe something like A star, to decide how to get from one room to the other, set waypoints for the best path forward, right, using some heuristic. And once those waypoints are set, the waypoints actually become the goal that the higher level controller sends to the lower level controller. So the lower level controller, remember, just gets a goal in X, Y coordinates. We send it that from the higher level, say, here's your next goal. It goes to that goal, avoiding things along the way. Once it gets there, the higher level sends the next waypoint, right? So that's how we're going to use these two levels uh, to map. Now, the controller for the higher level is most likely going to be a Jetson. I actually have a Jetson TX2 that I was using for YOLO and some TensorFlow work, but I'm not really using it right now, so I feel bad it's going to waste. And it is faster than a Nano, even though it's you know an older unit. It's larger, but I, I don't think it's too large. I think it'll fit because the development board for that was larger. But I might get a Jetson Nano because they are so small. So a little bit will depend on, on the design. I'm going to go higher on this guy so there'll be you know yet another platform on here and I haven't decided I actually have a robotic arm it currently has five degrees of freedom which would be fun to add to this and I have the wrist rotate too so it could have six but I might actually try to you know eventually like after we get uh, you know the higher level planning stage done, I might decide to add that as well. I think that would be fun. So I'm going to leave options open on that. But uh, so that's the idea. We're going to have another level here, another controller, the LiDAR, there's going to be optics. I mentioned visual odometry before. Uh, we're also going to do some other work uh, with computer vision. I thought it would be fun to take a look at the algorithms we're going to be building as part of the robotics programming series. I've installed them all here on Henry the Ninth, and while keep in mind this robot is literally a day old and it is not as perfectly tuned as I'm sure it will be shortly, I thought it would be fun to kind of explore this. So here we're seeing the go-to-goal behavior that's going to be part of the potential fields algorithm. He's traveling a set distance forward, uh, just going straight up the y-axis. And as you can see here, the center of the robot between the two wheels has ended right where the end of the measuring tape was. Here we're seeing the object avoidance behavior. So the go to goal and the object avoidance behavior are the two things that we're going to combine. They're not combined yet. I'm showing them individually here, uh, but we are going to combine those two behaviors to create the total potential fields algorithm. So you can see here that he is adjusting to things in the environment and doing his best to kind of stay centered. Now, it's not perfect. Um, you know, there are only only five ultrasonic sensors here so the amount of data that they provide again is limited but if you watch he does do a pretty good job of staying centered in the available environment and he also does a pretty good job of navigating through doorways and shuffling around furniture so this behavior works pretty well again I've done some tuning here I took a exponential curve uh, to the actual uh, magnitude of the objects as you get closer to them. So when he's close, he'll shuffle around. 
finally here, we have both of those behaviors happening at the same time. So he is going to a goal that's specifically 16 feet. Obviously, I converted that into centimeters in front of him. You can see along the way he is wavering back and forth a little bit, reacting to the wall on the left and the table on the right. But he's heading to that blue patch of tape there uh, right as you enter the office. Now, there was not yet any major obstacles in his way. This was a dry run to make sure that the go to goal behavior was working correctly. And it was pretty close. I actually adjusted uh, the wheel circumference just a hair. I mean, like, you know, we're talking millimeter, not even a fraction of micrometer um, over that distance. But uh, I had took out the calipers and, and reset that. But it was pretty close. And now we're going to do the same run with some obstacles in the way. Now, again, remember, this is the very first day, and I'm sure I'm going to tune this a little bit better as it goes on. But you can see here he takes off clean. It's the same runway, so to speak. And now there's these two boxes in the path. So you can see as he gets kind of pulled towards the goal, he gets pushed away from that wall for a moment, and then he gets pushed away from the box. And now he's getting pushed away from the red box, but he's still getting pulled towards the goal. And he's going to round the red box now, uh, hopefully not clip it, which he didn't, and make it to the goal. And that little adjustment I made really paid off because he was wiggling a little bit to get dead nut on, on, the, uh, on the blue tape there. Remember, he can't see it. It's just coordinates in Cartesian space for him. But you can see here it's right under the center of the wheels, which is exactly where it should be. So that's the update. I wanted to keep it quick. Uh, there's going to be more content coming. We're going to be doing this guy with like a wall following behavior. So that's what's next. We're going to add a servo here so we can control the orientation of this ultrasonic sensor. And that's going to introduce some new problems because we're going to have to know the orientation of the sensor against the orientation of the robot, which means we need to know the orientation of the robot. So we're going to be learning about all of that soon, which actually brings us to that good gold behavior as well. Uh, so that's all coming up really soon. So please check back in and I look forward to seeing you next time. No robots were harmed.